Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Catherine. I'm with the MSU Science Festival. Um, we are with our fifth presenter of the day for Ask a Scientist, um, our uh, first digital science festival event of the year. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, today we are here with Daniel from Woldemar Nature Center. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so before we dive into your, your topic, um, springtime in Michigan, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what your role at Woldemar Nature Center is? Yeah, um, I am the program director at Woldemar, so I'm responsible for all of our community programming, our school programming, and our camp programming. So it's a lot of great education that we do out at Woldemar, um, which we're continuing to do right now um, to the best of our ability with yeah, the limitations we have. Um, but you know, nature is still open and that's a great thing to know about Woldemar is you can still get out there and hike the trails, um, get some fresh air. We just ask that you're you know, being mindful of social distancing while you're out there and keeping yourself safe, um, you know, and you know, Nature is just great for your, both your physical and mental health. And I think everyone can uh, appreciate that right now, so. Oh, absolutely, I've got to get out there myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's perfect right now. Uh, this is a great time to talk about spring. Um, a lot of things I'll show you today are actually popping up right now at Woldemar. So you can get out there, um, get your hiking boots on. You might get a little bit muddy on a few spots of the trails, but the ephemeral wildflowers are starting to pop up. Um, the wildlife, is you're starting to move around lots of new birds and all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Whitney, thanks for tuning into our live stream. Um, she pointed out that there is a trillium behind you. <laughs> Absolutely, so um, one of our spring ephemerals, the one right behind me is a trillium um, and it's one of our most beautiful larger flowers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about all of our, our species that we will be able to see at Woldemar um, and and then talk about just their importance um, in the ecological um, niche that they, they, they perform as an important spring early blooming flower. Wonderful. All right, well, um, tell us more. What can we expect this springtime um, in Waldemar and, and in Michigan in general? Yeah, I'm gonna switch over and share my presentation over here. Okay, so springtime at Michigan. Um, so important to know, so spring has already happened. We are into spring. It started on Thursday, March 19th, and we go all the way until Saturday, June 20th, where we'll start summer. Um, so it's a great time of transition. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what does that mean both you know, in our natural communities, but also in us being on planet earth and our on our orbit around the sun. Um, so let's, let's move over. So this is a, a diagram, um, not to scale of course, um, but is a really good at showing um, our, our orbit around the sun, which takes 365 and a half or fourth days. So we had a leap year this year, so we made up that fourth day, which is really awesome. Um, so, you know, with everything that's going on in 2020, at least we had one extra day to enjoy it. Um, so we are here now in spring. Um, so the earth has a really nice axial tilt, which is at 23.4 degrees right now. Um, and that tilt does wobble. Um, it's not a constant thing throughout the earth's history. Um, it can be more or less, but right now we're at 23. Um, and here in the spring, um, we, we are right lined up with the sun at the equator. And then as we move into summer, that tilt then starts to uh, face towards the sun. Um, and that allows our Northern hemisphere to be um, having a longer day and shorter nights. And then anything above the Arctic circle, of course, is having their 24 hours of sunlight. And then if you're in the Southern hemisphere, of course, you are opposite and they are having their winter. Um, so they are having shorter days and if they're below the Antarctic Circle, of course, they are having 24 hours of night. And then as we move counterclockwise around the sun, we move to autumn. And that's just like spring where the sun is now lined up with the equator once again. And we move over into winter, winter where the Northern Hemisphere is having our shorter days. Um, so 
To look a little bit closer, this is um, a closer up picture of um, if our students are studying geography, this is an important thing. This is um, part of what you're expected to know. So this is, this is good studying up for you. Um, so as those sun rays come in, um, of course, this would be a diagram of winter in the Northern hemisphere and summer in the Southern hemisphere. So we have um, those rays lined up with the Tropic of Capricorn when it's in the winter. So that, that sun is lined up with that Southern hemisphere. So that, that line runs through the Southern part of Africa. And so they're having their summer. And then as we move into winter or spring or fall, then that sun is lined up with the equator once again. We're having equal days of night and day. So we have um, roughly 20 or 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness right at that equator line. And then as we move into summer here in the northern hemisphere, we have our longer days and the sun is lined up with that Tropic of Cancer, which um, runs a little bit farther north for us. And then also really important to understand um, is that the road Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. So it is elliptical and um, we are either farther or closer to the sun at different parts of our year, um, which many people don't know. They might know about the axial tilt, um, but um, they don't understand fully that we don't have a perfect circle as we're rotating around the sun, which is really interesting. So during our winter here in the Northern hemisphere, we are actually closer to the sun than we are in our summer in the Northern hemisphere. And this has a lot to do with our climate. Um, if, um, if this was opposite and the Northern hemisphere was closer to the sun in the summer, we would actually see much hotter summers. Um, than we do now. And this changes throughout Earth's history. And this has a lot to do with a lot of long climatory things that we think about, including ice ages will be related to this um, as they rotate around the sun, which is really cool. And then as we think about some of the really cool things that are happening um, with the plant animal life throughout spring, um, we have um, the birds to think of. Birds are really important. We think about migrations. Of course, lots of animals migrate, um, but birds are really known for those massive, large migrations that they can do, um, just thousands and thousands of miles. And what I have up here is um, a map of the, um, our hemisphere. So looking at Northern and Southern America and, and what's going on with those birds uh, throughout the year. Um, we have three different flyways that we think of with, with birds as they're, they're migrating. Um, many birds that are spending the summers up here in Michigan can go as far south as Brazil or even farther into Peru um, as, they, as they migrate down south for the winter. And then they're coming back up here this time of year. So the birds um, that you can see Moving on, so this represents 118 species, um, thanks to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have a really great website if you're into birds or looking to understand more about what's going on with birds, um, just a great resource. Um, and you can see as these dots move around, um, they change color based on the time of year. So that helps you orientate. So now that we're in December, back in January, slowly doing that migration, we can watch the birds coming up from South America. Many of them make a nonstop flight across the Gulf of Mexico. So that is a huge space for them to move. And then they move into the Great Lakes and then up into the boreal forest of Northern Canada. And then they take those trips right back. Um, so we, many of us have maybe seen um, the migrations that um, hummingbirds make. And even a hummingbird, a little ruby throated hummingbird that lives here in Michigan will fly from Mexico to um, the Gulf Coast all in one flight. So that's a lot for a little hummingbird to make. Um, and they really need those nectar sources and those food sources as they get across. Um, so right now we're already seeing some of our migratory birds um, that spend the winters here moving farther north. Our, our juncos have moved away. We're not seeing them very much. Um, and then we're, we're starting to see our warblers come back. Um, so the, the time for spring and the birds to come back we're seeing bluebirds at Woldemar. Um, they started nesting. Our, our, um, 
our tree swallows are back. If you get it out to the prairie, you'll see them, um, beautiful birds. Okay. And then here's a little bit about our spring ephemerals at Woldemar. So we have quite a few different species um, and each is uh, very unique that we call them us an ephemeral because they are short lived and they do their entire uh, reproductive um, time all before the leaves come out on the deciduous trees in the forest. Um, so you can find these species um, in, in areas of Woldemar that um, have deciduous trees. So um, we see a lot of these in our beech maple forest and our oak forest. And that's because they have the most sun on the forest floor. So all of these species need full sun in the spring to be able to do photosynthesis as fast as possible. They grow up even before some of the snow is off the ground. They're starting to pop up through the snow. They will collect that sunshine before the leaves come on the tree. They will flower and then they will die back all before uh, usually around June. So they're doing this really quickly. Um, and that is an, um, an evolutionary advantage to them because they get that full sun and it's not shaded out by all of those trees. Um, many other organisms that are living in our deciduous forests here in Michigan really rely on these early blooming flowers. Many of our native bees really do need this first nectar source and this first pollen source to get um, through the the hard part of winter and they know once they come out at the beginning of spring, once it warms up, they will have that nectar source available to them. Um, you saw the, the trillium that's behind me. Um, trillium are really important and one of those iconic flowers of a mature deciduous forest. Um, they're really important. Um, they're also a really you know, tasty snack for deer. So if you have a lot of deer in your area, sometimes you won't see um, very many trillium. Um, but the important part of trillium that um, many people don't know is um, if the flower gets eaten, then the, the plant will come back. But if the, the leaves are eaten by something, that plant will never be able to come back because it relies on all that energy it gets in the spring. So it doesn't have enough stored energy to then come back a next year. Um, another really cool one is our trout lily, our yellow trout lily. Um, they have these mottled uh, leaves and then a bright yellow flower. Sometimes you can also see white ones, but they're pretty rare. Um, this little plant takes between seven and 14 years to reach maturity before it'll flower for the first time. Um, and so a little plant you see might even be older than um, some of our viewers, our kids watching today and it takes very long time because it has only those few months before those leaves come on the trees to gather enough energy to grow. Um, so you gotta be careful when you're walking on, you don't wanna walk on something older than you. You gotta respect your elders. <laughs> um, right now at Woldemar, you can see lots of uh, things um, just starting to come up and, and bloom. Our, our spring beauties down here are starting to come up and they have a beautiful um, pink flower with lots of darker pink veins on them. Our cutly toothwort is starting to pop up. Um, our bloodroot, it has a beautiful white flower um, and these very cool leaves and they're starting to pop up and bloom if you keep an eye out for them. Our wild leeks have come up. Our hepatica or, or leather leaf is another one that you can find. Um, and these beautiful flowers can be white all the way to a beautiful lavender color. And then our skunk cabbage has come up and our skunk cabbage has a really cool adaptation where this flower comes up early, early spring. And then it has a process using um, cellular respiration to create heat around it. And that will be able to melt the snow so that that flower is up and available to those first pollinators coming out in the spring. And it's able to create enough heat that it melts the snow around it and the flower is able to open up um, and that's one of our first signs of spring, which is really awesome. And then finally, we're also starting to see our May apples just start to pop up um, through the ground. So lots of things to keep an eye on um, as you go out there. And um, many of these um, plants are endangered or threatened or listed species because they do require um, a native habitat that is not disturbed. And there's not much of that habitat left in Michigan. We've um, cut down a lot of our um, native forests. Um, 
either for logging or for farming or just for other human uses. Um, so having undisturbed um, old growth forest in Michigan is really important for these species because they take so long before they reach maturity. Um, and so all, not only the human impacts of, of their, their life, but we also have invasive species to be thinking about. And these are the two species at Woldemar that we are keeping an eye on and working to mitigate um, that have the biggest effect on our spring ephemeral wildflowers. Um, maybe you're familiar with some of these. Maybe you, you've, you've helped pick some of these before to help get them rid, or um, you're just learning about them now. But the two is garlic mustard and dame's rocket. Um, both were brought in um, hundreds of years ago as um, Europeans moved into um, North America. Um, garlic mustard is an herb. It's actually an edible herb. Um, you can eat both the root and the leaves from this plant. And that's why it was brought over as an herb to grow for food. And it really makes a great pesto. Um, so you can make invasive species pesto to help eradicate um, this species. Um, and then Dame's Rocket has a beautiful flower um, that many people enjoy. But um, both of these plants um, are considered invasive because um, they overtake and outcompete the native species in their habitat. And they also have um, alleopathic um, chemicals that they produce in their roots. Um, and this helps them compete um, and outcompete these native species. So that chemical they produce stunts the growth of other plants around them and gives them a competitive advantage. Um, so both of these species are really important to make sure that we don't have them in our, our pristine um, habitats that have our spring ephemerals. And there's, there's great ways that you can help um, do this. One is making sure you clean your boots before you go hike at a natural area um, so that you don't have any hitchhiking seeds and then clean your boots after you leave um, and making sure those seeds aren't getting into an area um, where they might be able to germinate. So at Woldemar, we first start seeing these species along the trails and in our parking lot area. And then they slowly started migrating out from there. So where you see the most human traffic is where you start seeing these invasive species. Um, and the other thing you can do is help pull these. These are really easy species to pull out of the ground. And once they're pulled out of the ground, they don't come back um, if you get the entire root. Um, so they're really easy um, species to help manage and you can eradicate them from a natural area if you're really diligent about ripping um, the entire root out and getting them before they go to seed. Um, and then a really important resource um, is MISSEN, which is the Midwest Invasive Species Network. They have a fantastic app you can use um, that you can download and um, that you can report things through that and that information goes right to MSU, which is great and, um, and it helps us keep track of what's going on. Um, and then at Woldemar, we also use iNaturalist and we have access to the species that um, you find. So if you've ever used iNaturalist, it's a great app. You take a picture of anything that you're not sure what it is and then it suggests um, different um, species that it might be and then you can record that and then we have access to that information and can go out and, and verify to see what we've, we've found. Um, so, that is all I have for that presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions about spring ephemerals or spring in general, or what's going on at Woldemar in uh, natural communities, I'd be love to answer those questions for you. So we do have a couple questions actually. Uh, the first question, um, someone wants to know, uh, where did skunk cabbage get its name? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, as we know, skunks don't have a very pleasant smell and neither does this plant. So it produces really large leaves and it is a wetland plant. You find it in very moist uh, soils that has a lot of humus, which is uh, organic matter. And if you tear or step on any of these leaves, it smells exactly like a skunk. Okay, makes sense. Yep. <laughs> um, another question we got was, uh, how do birds know where to migrate? Yeah, so that's a, another really great question. So um, these are inherent things that the birds have um, evolved knowing. So this is something that they've done for thousands of generations and have taken the same flight paths. Um, they also have some ability to sense the, um, the Earth's magnetic 
field so they can um, sense which directions are north and south and they can move along those. And then they do know their, their path and they'll use different um, uh, clues like the Great Lakes are a really great clue to, for a bird as they're migrating south. Oh, I need to follow this large lake that's always been there and I'm going to follow that lake and then I'm gonna maybe follow the Mississippi River. Many of them follow the Mississippi River. So they follow these geographic flight paths that help them get to where they go. Or if you're moving south and you're following um, the coast of the Atlantic or the Pacific, you know that you can follow that geographic line right to where you need to go. Um, another question. Um we got was uh, about the garlic mustard pesto. And I'm curious as well if uh, one, you have a recipe that you can share. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely share a recipe in the comments uh, section after we're done with this. Um, but it's really easy, just like you would make pesto with basil, um, you can do the same thing. So you can harvest uh, the, the, the leaves from the garlic mustard. Um, make sure you clean them off, just like you would with anything you're growing out in the garden. Um, and then you just um, put them in with, you know, whatever kind of um, other garlic you might want or some olive oil, and then you um, grind it up in your food processor or a blender and it makes a great pesto. And now the, the flavor of it, is it more garlicky? Is it more mustardy? What's the flavor? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very faint of both. Um, it is in the mustard family, so it has um, very small uh, seeds, just like any other mustard plant that you might be familiar with. Um, it does not have a very strong flavor, so you do maybe have to use a little bit more of it than you would normally do with like a basil pesto. Um, some people like it, some people don't, um, you know, but it's good just to get out there and, and remove it either way. So um, it, if you like the flavor of it, it's a great uh, thing to do. Fantastic. Um, and taking it back to our migratory birds, um, uh, someone asked, what can we do to help the birds right now? Yeah, that's that's really great, good question. So one is making sure you have the appropriate habitat um, available for these birds. So thinking about um, what does a bird need um, in your little slice of your backyard or your area of that you live in. So do you have native food sources for these birds? So one way is providing um, native flowers or fruit bearing trees. So these birds have um, sources as they're moving forward. Um, so you can you know, get, we're gonna be ha hopefully having a native plant sale come June if everything we're allowed to at that time. Um, but you know, gardening with native plants, um, make sure they have the appropriate food sources that they've uh, evolved to eat, making sure they have clean water sources um, for bathing, for drinking, things like that. Um, having nesting um, areas for them. So if you are providing a nest box for the bird, making sure it's the appropriate size hole and style for each bird, which you can find that um, information on the Audubon website or pr um, probably also on the, um, the ornithology um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, I'm sure they also have some of that information, but I can uh, supply that information in the comments section too, if that's interested. Um, and then um, really important too, is making sure your human structures are safe for the birds. Um, so birds did not evolve with having lights and lights can be really distracting and confusing for birds. Um, before there were human lights, the only light that they would see was from the stars and the moon, and then that reflecting off of surfaces like water. Um, so many of our waterfowl, when they see light, they think that's a body of water reflecting moonlight, and they try to go land there, and it's not, it's a, it's a building. And then many birds also can't see glass. Um, it reflects off of um, their environment. So they're seeing a bush or a tree reflected in that glass and they think it's a bush or a tree to go land on or hide in and they can't see the glass. So one way you can provide um, safe windows is to use bird tape and it reflects ultraviolet light so they can see the window and know that they shouldn't fly into it. 
Well, we have five minutes left here. Um, so we have time for one more question. Um, and I, everyone, feel free to keep ask, asking your questions in the comments section. Uh, Dan's going to stick around afterwards to answer the questions that you have. Um, so our last question, um, Caleb would like to know, where do bugs go in the winter? Yeah. Um, so this is another really important reason to have native plants um, growing in your garden and leaving the stalks and the old dead material behind. So many of our native insects will overwinter in stems or in the leaf litter of our natural areas. So if you are able to um, lay your garden stuff down at the end of the year on top of the bed or leave it standing throughout the winter, that's where our native insects and pollinators are overwintering. If you cut that down and burn it, you've just destroyed uh, all of those native uh, pollinators and insects that are overwintering in that area. So really good time to clean up from last fall is this spring and then finding a nice pile to set all that in. So all of those beneficial organisms can emerge this spring and then get back in your garden and help you um, see great pollination and pest control with those native organisms that are eating those pests. So um, make sure you don't clean up your garden, leave it messy. Messy is good. <laughs> Fantastic, great. Well, thank you again, Dan. Um, this was really wonderful. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, taking a hike at Waldemar and checking out some of these native plants soon. Yeah, please um, do. Thank you. For everybody um, who's tuning in, we still have uh, a whole wide selection of live streams going until 430 today. So be sure to stay tuned. All right. Thanks so much.